Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 28th year, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than that, though. We have had on other brands of artists, sculptors, musicians, actors, so if you have an idea for a guest who might be good for the writer's block, a writer or stranger kind of artist, watch for our address at the end of the program. We'd be glad to get your suggestions. I also want to remember, excuse me, remind you that the writer's block and all the other original productions out of Cape Ann TV are for and about Cape Ann and the result of cable access television. This is a wonderful community property, community asset, and you don't get this if you subscribe to DISH. So don't pay attention to those ads. You stick with cable, you watch the writer's block and all the rest of our wonderful programming here on Cape Ann TV. Tonight, I'm very happy to say we do have a writer, a memoirist by the name of Clem Schonebeck, and I'm going to read the bio note about Clem Schonebeck from his new book, Dancing with Fireflies. Clemens Carl Schonebeck has had poetry published in the Aurorian, Midwest Poetry Review, Caribbean Writer, Ibbotson Street Press, Small Brushes Adept Press. Three of his poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, a very uh, distinguished uh, nomination, I might point out. His 9-11 poem, For the Angels Unwinged, was published in the Aurorian's Favorites edition, celebrating their first 15 years of poetry. Several of his short stories have won prizes in the Writers' World Competition, Marblehead Festival of Arts. In 2012, he won both poetry and fiction prizes. His winning poem was also the winner of the Marcia Donor Award. In addition, he was named the winner of the first George Jack Beck Award for fiction writing. He lives on the North Shore of Boston with his wife, Bonnie. His, daughter, his daughter's family lives nearby. His granddaughters are usually available for lunch. <laughs> Welcome to the Writer's Block. <laughs> Thank now, you, John. Thank Very you. kind of you to have me. I like that introduction because it points <laughs> out that you're a multi-talented writer. You are with us this mm -hmm. evening because of Dancing with Fireflies, a memoir a wonderful, emotional, striking memoir, but you are very much a poet and also a writer of fiction. Yes, and uh, sometimes I don't know where the one starts and the other stops, but uh, uh, the, the writing, I, I was introduced to all this through poetry, I thought sort of accidental. Uh, I was inspired to write my first poet poetry-like bit of uh, putting words on the paper when I saw my first granddaughter born in my, you know, 30 minutes after she was born in my daughter's arms and something happened to me from that point and it eventually led to my writing this story which was about my healing with my mother this, who was yes, schizophrenic. The, 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 the book is a memoir and prose but you begin it with a poem and yes. you close it with a poem. Right. Now the, as you mentioned this is a, a memoir about your mother and you dealing with your mother's Schism. challenging life. Exactly. Tell us, tell us a, a, a about that. My mother uh, was um, labeled uh, paranoid schizophrenic um, her symptoms really started before her marriage to my father, but they were sort of under wraps, and she was one of 11 children in a big family, uh, very uh, rigid, devout Catholicism, uh, and there was a lot of uh, idea that we'll pray this away. And, uh, uh, and when my mother met my father and they eventually married, uh, I think the whole family was pretty relieved that my mother was now in somebody else's hands, but her symptoms were rather under wraps, and, uh, and then I found later, through reading the medical records of my mother's um, time in a mental hospital, which the hospital very kindly released to me when I had questions about whether 
I was remembering things accurately when writing this. Um, it was obvious through reading the uh, medical records that, he, and this is back in 1945, is that the people were very kind and cared about her, but also I found a very striking comment that her symptoms really exacerbated upon the birth of her first son, and that's me. So we have a pretty profound connection in that way. So, so as your wife says, you quote her in the book, uh, after you visit the old hospital where your mother right. had been uh, yes. had, had been resident, that uh, your wife says you have some work to do. It's true. Did you did you feel that? I I I felt there was some kind of unrest, and uh, what happened is that this is many years after my mother died. I believe it was about eleven years after she died, and we were going home to State College, Pennsylvania, to visit my father, who was then ninety two. And um, uh, and on the way, we stopped for lunch. We were about 45 miles away from State College, and we stopped in a, uh, a truck stop, the Buckhorn Truck Plaza. I'll never forget it. There was a display of black and white photography, and I was stunned in front of one of the pictures. It was the picture of the mental hospital where my mother uh, was sent when I was eight years old. And I saw this picture, and I... I was just frozen, and um, then my wife saw the picture, and we started talking about it. The hospital was five miles down the road, and my wife said, I think it's time for you to go visit. And I thought, well, okay. And make a long story short, we found it, and I got out of the car, and I had always been sort of skeptical when I, my wife was a, a uh, uh, worked as a psychotherapist, and I always sort of wondered about the word flashback. I got out of the car and I stood there and I saw the big dark door that my father went through when I was eight years old and we were going for our first visit to see I, her. You, you remember and that I went visit? back, I went back there. And, um, uh, and it was then after that weekend of talking with my father who very, very graciously was able to answer my questions and fill in the blanks and on the return trip to Swampscott, where I live, um, going back home, we passed the sign to the hospital, and I was totally silent. And my wife said, honey, you have work to do. And it was absolutely right. And, and then I wrote the poem, which is at the see, end of this story. Uh, there's a very nice picture in here of, I want to see if I can find it immediately, of your mother, Sophie Henrietta Drogon. Oh, her first communion her, her, picture. Uh, uh, no, it was... Uh, it'd be at the, near the back. It's, it's the, the, uh, an adult picture. Yeah, that and would it, be very close to the back there. With, uh, yeah, well, I think it's real close to the, the very back. With, uh, you know, you're getting close. <laughs> I'll find there, it. There, it would be uh, just before the Vespers poem, I think. Oh, I bet it's after the Vespers poem. That's there. Uh, there you go. Here, I'll see if we can hold this up. I'll hold this yeah. up. The, uh, yeah. uh, would you describe what we're looking at there? Uh, well, Clint? what we're looking at here, uh, my brothers, uh, my youngest brother, Alfred, in the middle, my next brother, Bill, and I was the oldest, had a lot more hair then. <laughs> I was the oldest of the three, and I always tried to protect my brothers. I had this image in growing up, the shorthand would be that I always step between my brothers and my mother. And then of course on the bottom is my mother and my father. And um, now, um, may, yeah. Maybe go back and say, explain that there was danger to the boys yes. from your mother. Can you give us yes. some background on that? My mother uh, began to hear voices, actually heard voices when she was younger. Her, her own father died in an accident involving fire when she was she was eight or ten years old and she had that imagery of hellfire and brimstone it just frightened her and I think it contributed to her to her distress for the rest of her life and uh, but when we were growing up if she was in uh, a dark place where she was hearing the voices um, 
Uh, uh, excuse me, yeah. by dark place, you mean psychologically, psychologically dark? Psychologically When the dark. lights were yeah. low. Psychologically. Absolutely, just psychologically a dark place. Uh, she, she could be very unpredictable. She would hear through the telephone wires voices, and she had fears that the devil's voices would affect her sons. And so sometimes I think out of fear, if she felt that we were misbehaving, she could be pretty strict once in a while. Someone would get slapped, and I sort of had this image that I had to protect my brothers and stand between my brothers and my mother. Uh, in reality, it might have been more of an image than reality, but it, sometimes it's how it worked. Well, your father yeah. did mention that my, his fear of... Uh uh, for her doing possibly exactly doing harm. exactly my father was a rock he he was very very steady and it was very difficult he was a very stubborn determined german and he perhaps didn't know how to be soft around this he only knew how to muscle his way through it and just try to be he was like a rock and so we had that stability there and there were times when uh, when my mother was in a wonderful mood and uh, the voices weren't there the images weren't there and she uh, particularly when we would get into uh, uh, some of the religious holidays and uh, there would always be a frenetic period of time when we had to get the house clean and everything to honor whatever the saint was or Christmas or whatever but then when she uh, calmed down she felt uplifted she was she could be fun we could laugh with her she could be a wonderful cook made some great pies so we didn't have all gloom and doom we had our moments of uh, being pretty happy you know now, was that uh, seemingly uh, uh, randomly sporadic or was it because of medication or treatment or no it was more sporadic uh, and we talked a little bit about medication uh, I think that this the stage that my mother was in at that time if they had had the perfect pill that would cure her schizophrenia she would have thought that you were trying to drug her or dope her as she said because even at, at that time, though, the, the best medications were sledgehammers exactly. by, by our standards. Exactly. Sure, sure. And I, I, I really, truly, the, the strides they've made in treatment today, uh, it's like night and day. But yeah. the wonderful thing, as I mentioned, when I did get access to the medical records, I, my breath was taken away by the language and the 10 or 12 pages of records that the hospital forwarded to me the words of the clinicians, the doctors, the nurses, uh, the helpers, uh, it was not judgmental. It was clear that they were objective and they, uh, they, they really sincerely wanted to be of help to my mother. What a, and I never understood that at the well, that's time. That's heartening. Well, it, it is. It's part Absolutely. of your journey back. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So. I want to talk a little bit about the structure. I enjoyed the okay. overall structure. Right. You uh, you begin with that trip. Yes. So we're in the present. Yes. Uh, or the, the the virtual present of the of the book. Exactly. And then you and you go back and talk about your youth and growing up. Exactly. Then you come back to the present. It's true. Then you true. go back and there's a nice tension there of going back and forth and back and yes. forth. And uh, did that evolve, or was that part of the lightning that struck or with the first idea of the book? Yes. I, I, what had actually is very, a very good question. I had been invited, after I had been writing poetry for a while, I had been invited into a uh, short story writers group where there were four or five of us, and my, my friends and my, we call ourselves the Marblehead Writers Group, and my contributions to the group very often were little short stories about my childhood. There was a story in here about my first baseball mitt. There was a Fourth of July story where my mother had been in a bad place and uh, my brothers and I went to the carnival and celebrated and came back and a bunch of short stories. And I ran out of ideas for my writer's group and one of them said, well, why don't you write your memoir? And I said, I don't know how to write a memoir. And they said, you've already started it. There were five or six short stories, which I did weave into it. Mm -hmm. So I had that sense of where I was in my family history with these stories. And then on that long weekend when I 
saw the hospital and had my flashback, had my conversation with my father, there were questions that I could ask him about my mother's history that started to tie it together. Did the visit with your father? When yes, I went yes. And then when 92. I went back that weekend, it's sort of like the book starts with a visit to my father, ends with the Vespers poem that I, I wrote two, three days later, uh, but then I filled the whole history in between. So I, and I thought, how am I going to get from here to there? And it's just that I had to make this big, big arch of my history and sometimes touching base with the present. But it was sort of accidental that it came out that way. But I don't think I could have written it any other way. Vespers, by the way, is a liturgical name for afternoon, afternoon prayer. prayers. Yes. Yeah. And where that came from is uh, when my father took me at the age of eight to visit my mother at that visit that, visit that I recalled, uh, when it was like there was one big waiting room. It was a Saturday afternoon, and all of the, um, I, I wanted to call them inmates, but all of the, the patients were in rocking chairs in a big semicircle, and the visitors were clustered in between, you know, with my mother was in her rocking chair, and we, we had this conversation, and, um, uh, and it was... Uh, it was, I was just starting to get comfortable with it. And then in the mid-afternoon, as the light goes down, I was told this by people who, uh, therapists who work with, with really disturbed mental patients, the diminished afternoon light can be agitating. Really? Yes, and I didn't know that. So we were sitting there in front of my mother, and all of a sudden, one person started to rock, and then another patient started to rock, and I could see my mother's eyes searching around, and she was looking at me, and I could see fear in her eyes, and then she started rocking. It was like a trance, and she got into this, and the rocking went back, and I actually heard people murmuring, and I the only thing I could think was the idea of speaking in tongues or something, but just this murmuring going on. And it's, it was scary. And, um, and later, you know, at, toward the end of that, as I reflect in the poem, when it was time to leave, I got up and my mother, you know, she really clutched me. She didn't want me to leave. But as I left and looked back, um, I eventually looked at that experience as Vespers, the afternoon prayers, and whatever it was those patients were feeling through the rocking, the rhythmic back and forth, and their, their whatever it was coming out of their mouths or their hearts or their souls, who knows? I, I, I considered that to be Vespers, and it was my take on it. And when I wrote that poem, uh, in the actual writing of the poem over a period of two nights, I felt like I had healed with my mother. And it was the, so the work poetry. Was, the work was done. Yes. The poetry. You were free to love her, I think. You said that's what you, it you, was. You felt like. Absolutely. So, uh, very moving. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you, just kind of dropping a bomb, sure. to read a passage. Of course. That's maybe a favorite passage of yours that kind of reflects the tone right. or the subject matter just right. for a, a, a sure. minute or two. Yes. Actually, uh, I, I had some passages marked, but it's better if you choose. Right. Uh, I, I'll tell you what I can read here. Uh, you know, my mother. I have a, um, a First Communion picture of her. It's in here. You can't really see it in here, but and I, w I wish I had brought it. It's, it's a treasure. She's, she's in her white gown uh, holding her prayer book and um, uh, with this beautiful... I'm so sorry I didn't bring the, the portrait, but I, one of my favorite things is that I took this picture and I described it uh, and it says a lot about my mother at this young age and where she was going. And so I have this beautiful picture of her sitting there as I okay. describe. So cool. I start to describe it. I found, found this framed picture and so on. And then uh, it's her first communion picture. So my writing that I think expresses what I was able to feel about my mother. It is the day of Sophie Henrietta Drogi's first Holy Communion. My mother's face is softened by the available light which comes from over her right shoulder, leaving her left side dimly shadowed. 
Her sweet face reflects her love of Jesus in that luminosity, the glow not harsh, but fluidly radiant on her dress. Her right cheek looks as if it would feel warm against my own cheek if I held my face up to hers on the other side of the glass. My mother's smile is subtle, hopeful, watchful, looking for Jesus. Her smile says, I believe. Her eyes are shaped like almonds, each eyebrow traced like the thin outline of a floating gull's wing. Can a nose be perfect? Not too big or small, not too sharp or blunt. My mother's nose is perfect with a straight line running down the ridge between the sunlit right side and the shaded left half of her face. Her lips are straight, not the slightest upward curl at the ends, and yet her smile takes hold of me, blurs me in my eyes and my heart. The outline of her face is soft and symmetrical, tapered to a delicately rounded chin, a faint shadow brushed beneath her lower lip, a hint of a dimple, something save for a future smile. She confidently looks out from her portrait, the unshadowed eye focused on me. She is speaking to me. I am here, she seems to say. Everything about me is in this picture. It's as if that image with its black and white contrast is a metaphor for the light and shadows my mother would come to know. One crucifix darkly blurred behind her, another glinting in hopeful clarity beside her. Something else about this portrait. I look at her left eye on the cloudy side of her face. If I study it carefully, hold it in just the right slant of sun, I see her searching for Jesus in the unlit places. Already, Sophie Henrietta Drogi can see in the darkness. Very nicely done. Very, very nicely done. Uh, And I wanted to uh, underline, I think you mentioned this, that both your family and... uh, and hers, I, I, both both your mother's family and your father's family were very devout Roman Catholic yes. German immigrants. Right, exactly. The first exactly. or second generation. Exactly. My father came here from Germany when he was 20 years old. He wasn't as dogmatic about the religion as was my mother, but uh, but he he believed that you know that our Sunday mornings uh, were tailored to go to church and, you know, get that part of what we're supposed to get. I I know from uh, my own experience Uh that uh, uh, a very devout faith can make you think that faith will fix everything. It's almost a a Christian science attitude in in many ways. And it's sadly incorrect. Exactly. And does it doesn't work. And this this was a tough lesson for me because as a as a young child, you know, I was taught like you be good and you pray and and if you're good enough, Jesus will take care of you. Well, I prayed a lot that he fixed my mother and when it didn't happen, I kept thinking, well, maybe I'm not good enough. And that if I had to look back, reflect back, that was one of the things that uh, I, I regret about that childhood religion that uh, there could not have been uh, a more comprehensive, compassionate understanding yes. without blaming yes. God for not fixing. Yes, you know? I, I always I, I think of that often uh, because of my own background. But always uh, in terms of cancer, when people say, "We just you got to fight it, yes, and meditate," and then if, you, if it comes back, <laughs> it's well, your you fault. You up. didn't meditate you hard enough. Yeah, right, right. Right, right. Exactly. Um, yeah. We're getting. A little close, and okay. I want to ask you some technical questions. Yes. How long did it take you to write this? I, I really spent, uh, actually, if I count the time when I started the short stories, I, I could easily say five or six years, but when I really got into this as a project, I still probably spent a good three years, and I, and I did, I wrote a couple manuscripts, and then at my friend Dennis Must, who was the the author who encouraged me to do this, who was a dental patient of mine, I, I went to an editor that he recommended. So I'm going to hold this up again. Yeah. Uh, this is Dancing with Butterfly, Fire Fireflies, Fireflies, excuse yeah. me, with the, yeah. with the uh, nice cover done by a former nationally known uh, illustrator, cartoonist, I guess you would say, uh, your my cousin, cousin, cousin. My cousin. Uh, yeah. Where is this available? Uh, on Amazon. Amazon. I did it through uh, Create Space after I had a few near misses with some publishers. They said if I was better known, they would have 
published it's it. It's a crowded market. And I got a there. big name. I got 11 letters, and Stephen King only has four, so I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> right. What, how would you advise others? We have viewers out there, I'm sure, right. who are thinking about writing their own histories, their own challenges and coming through. What yeah. would you advise them to do, or how would you say they should start? Well, I, I think, first of all, if, if you think you have a story and you're not sure, what have you got to lose by taking notes, fill a, fill a, a notebook, you know, uh, uh, just whatever thoughts come into your mind, and, uh, and write down all the stories that you remember that touched you in some way, and then I think you have to... I, I'm no expert, you would be far more of that, but I, I think it's very helpful that, to then have a couple of trusted readers and uh, not necessarily people that know you too well. Uh, my friend Dennis Must, who was the writer that encouraged me to That's do That's interesting. This. Yes, and he said at the time, I gave him the manuscript and he said, this is terrific. If it's just for your brothers and your writer's group, don't touch it. I had poetry in it and everything else. And then he said, but if you're going to, quote, get it out there, and I didn't really know what he meant by that, it needs the firm hand of an editor who does not know you. And finally, I understood what that meant, and I sent it to a woman named Paulette Bates Alden, who was fabulous and, and kind of brought me down to where I had to be. But but I think that if somebody wants to do that, have a trusted reader. Maybe you're going to start with friends, but eventually start, start get with to friends because you need yes. encouragement. You need but encouragement. Then yeah. you have to separate yourself from people who are going to say, wonderful, I just loved it. What'd you like about it? Oh, everything. Everything, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, which is just not a helpful, right. not a helpful exactly. reaction if you want to exactly. get it out there. It's true. And Paulette Bates Alden, incidentally, on the one page that I thought was heroic and just the whole world needed it, in her manuscript, she circled it and put an arrow in the margin, and it said, look, Ma, I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you do need that, but only after uh, you've had some encouragement. One of Elmore Leonard's, uh, the, the mystery writer, Elmore Leonard's advice to writers was, if it looks like writing, scratch it out. That's it's probably that's terrific. Yeah, it's good advice. Yeah. We're almost through with our yes. fast half hour. Yeah. I enjoyed that half hour very thank much, you. Clem Schonebeck, and thank you very much indeed for sharing this memoir, which is moving thank and you. interesting and very very well written. Thank and you. I say that not as a friend. I don't yes. know you well. Thank you. But as an objective uh, reader. Thank you. And my hope would be that, which I, the feedback that I've had, that it is hopeful and encouraging. It's not a downer. It's a, that it is to not. be no, lifted up. Positive. And, and it's in love. I've had feedback from many people who said now they're talking with their siblings about stuff that they had to keep seeing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I want to thank all of you out there in TV land for watching the Writer's Block. Uh, if you have uh, learned something from Clem Schonebeck about his book, Dancing with Fireflies, and coming to a realization and an acceptance of a challenging life he had growing up with his mother, uh, then the Writer's Block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the Writer's Block. Good night. <laughs>